This is the NS Eccentric Chromo, an affordable hardtail with a beautiful chromoly steel frame, which, if you aren't familiar, is basically the hipster material of bike frames. Don't believe me? It was the standard for retro bikes. It's expensive. It isn't mass-produced like aluminum or carbon bikes, and it has a loyal cult following that only purists would understand. While hipster culture is rather insufferable, like those silly-looking mustaches and expensive avocado toast, they do manage to get some things right. And as the saying goes, steel is real. With steel mountain bikes not being as common anymore, they are often just as expensive, if not more expensive, than some full suspension mountain bikes. But at $2,000, the NS Eccentric Chromo is a steal. So what makes this hipster bike so affordable? Let's talk about it. The NS Eccentric is an aggressive 140mm travel hardtail offered in both aluminum and this chromoly steel version. It is sold exclusively with 29-inch wheels, but you can run 27.5-inch plus wheels like I have on mine. I'll be talking about the specs on my 2019 model, but I'll also be talking about what has changed for the new 2021 model. This bike came specced with Octane 1 solar rims, laced to NS rotary hubs, and WTB Trail Boss tires. I did like the look of the tan wall tires, but I didn't run that setup very long because those tires tore very easily. After that, I decided to switch to these FSA 27.5 plus wheels with TerraVale 2.8 inch tires, and these things offer a monstrous amount of grip. The fork is a RockShox Recon, which uses 32 millimeter stanchions, and this is where it starts making sense that this bike is only $2,000. It's a decent fork that comes on a lot of entry-level hardtails in the $1,000 to $1,500 price range, but these smaller stanchions quickly get overwhelmed in tougher riding conditions. Not exactly the fork you want specced on an aggressive steel hardtail. This is technically a light trail or cross-country fork, and it honestly has no business being on this particular bike. I overpressurized this fork just to get it feeling decent because when I did try to run it at the recommended pressure for my weight, it felt way too spongy and it just didn't feel good. This is definitely my least favorite component on this bike. Another low spec point are these SRAM level two piston brakes with 180 millimeter rotors front and rear. This bike is pretty heavy for a hardtail and these brakes do not offer enough stopping power. Speaking of weight, as it sits currently, this thing weighs 35.6 pounds. This bike actually weighs more than my full suspension bike. It isn't the end of the world because when riding this bike, it actually doesn't feel as heavy as it actually is. Drivetrain is the SRAM NX Eagle 12 speed and it's been fine. It isn't good, it isn't bad, it's just average. This bike originally came specced with an X-Fusion Manic dropper post with 125 millimeters of travel, which is just way too short for a size large. The post used to stick like way up here. It looked horrible and it kind of sucked when I wanted to do jumps and stuff. My seat would always tap me on the rear end and that wasn't acceptable, appropriate, or enjoyable. I have since switched it to a P&W Bachelor dropper post with 170 millimeters of travel. P&W components are incredible, they're affordable, and they just always work. I use them on every bike I have. All of the other components are NS branded and I haven't had any issues with those at all. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's changed for the 2021 model year. The brakes and drivetrain have been changed to Shimano and the larger size frames now come with a 150 millimeter dropper rather than the 125 millimeter that my bike came with. It also now comes with a Maxxis Minion and Aggressor tire combo instead of those tan wall WTB Trail Boss tires. The color is now this really cool dark red, but the frame the fork and the rest of the spec is basically the same as this bike. Speaking of the frame, this thing is beautiful and that's where most of your two grand is going towards. It does have ISCG05 mounts, bottle cage mounts on the down tube, and internal routing for the dropper post, with the rest of the cables being externally routed. I'm not crazy about the zip tie approach to holding the external cables down, and while filming the shots for the frame, I noticed two of them have actually broken off. I don't know where that happened, but I do need to put new zip ties on there. The zip tie thing is definitely kind of a letdown and doesn't make the frame look as clean, but that is just a minor gripe. 
But enough about the specs, let's go ahead and talk about how this thing actually rides. I've had this bike for two years now, and it's an absolute pleasure to ride. I know I'm gonna sound like a hipster here really quick, but if you haven't ridden a steel frame, I highly recommend it. Steel frames aren't as stiff as aluminum bikes, and they offer a little bit more flex. Therefore, the ride quality isn't as harsh as an aluminum hardtail. There's plenty of other videos detailing the differences between frame materials, and this video is not gonna dive that much deeper into it. I actually preferred riding this bike over my old YT GFC, and to this day, I still grab it for most local rides. A 65 degree head tube angle with a 74 degree seat tube angle and 475 millimeter reach in size large. While those numbers aren't as radical as some newer steel hardtails like the Marin Elroy or the Norco Torrent, I think this geometry is a little bit more well-rounded and to me it feels really good. Even though this bike is really heavy, it actually climbs very well. The head tube angle isn't stupidly slack and there's a generous amount of reach for me to alter my body position and keep that front wheel planted when things get really steep, which isn't very often around here. I would prefer to see a steeper seat tube angle somewhere in the 75, 76 degree range to make climbing even easier, but as it is, it still isn't a complete chore to climb this bike. And that nearly 36 pound weight is just gonna make your legs even stronger. While this bike was pretty cool with 29 inch wheels, I personally think it's a bit more fun with the 27.5 inch plus wheels. It has short 430 millimeter chain stays and a fairly long wheelbase, which makes it both playful and planted depending on the situation. I love doing jumps, drops, and bunny hops on this bike just as much as I do pointing it down a technical descent. With the geometry being somewhat moderate by today's standards, it's easy to navigate rocky technical sections, which is pretty much the majority of the riding I do. The only thing really holding this bike back, again, is the fork and the brakes. So with the moderately aggressive geometry paired to a compliant steel frame, smoothing out the smaller hits, you've got a pretty impressive do-it-all hardtail. So who is this bike for? If you classify yourself as a trail rider that likes to do a little bit of everything, and you also want the ride characteristics of steel, then this is a really great option without spending an absolute fortune. If you do pick this bike up, I would strongly suggest replacing this fork with something a little bit burlier, and you may be screaming at your screen right now asking why I haven't done that, and the short answer is I'm cheap. $2,000 is still a lot of money, especially for a hardtail that isn't my main bike. If I had upgraded the fork and brakes like I've been complaining about most of this video, I would easily be over three grand into this bike. And at that point, I can buy a full suspension bike, which I did. If this were my only bike, I would have ditched this fork a very long time ago. You can buy this as a frame only option. I'll put the price on the screen because I don't remember how much that is. But if you have extra parts laying around or you just don't care about the price and wanna build up a nice steel frame, that option is available to you. But if you aren't as cheap as me, you can buy the complete bike, swap out that fork for something burlier and go rip it. Who should skip this bike? If you classify more as an XC rider where speed and efficiency are the name of the game, you'd definitely be better off getting a lighter aluminum or carbon bike. Also on the flip side, if you're more a downhill oriented rider and you live somewhere with more long epic climbs, you don't care how long it takes to get to the top, all you care about is going down, then you'd probably be better suited for something like the Marin Elroy or Norco Torrent that I mentioned earlier. The Anessa Centric Chromo is a really awesome bike, and I do think it would be near perfect with just a few component changes. But even if you just ride it the way it comes, it is still a great entry into the hipster world of steel. Thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate your time. Let me know down in the comments what you think about steel bikes. Are they for hipsters or was that just a bad metaphor? As always, don't forget to like the video and consider subscribing if you aren't already. Thank you so much for watching and until the next one, stay rowdy within reason. Please go away. It is not quiet here at all. Can't find a quiet place to film. Ugh. Oh my goodness. You never realize how loud a place is until you go to film something. Like normally kids on swings, I wouldn't notice the sound of it that much, but they're 
a solid football field, if not two football fields away from me, and just the screeching from that swing set is killing me. There's some semi-trucks back there at some kind of factory doing some work. I don't know. Filming outside is the worst. But at $2,000, the NS-eccentric chromo is a steal. $2,000, the NS-eccentric chromo is a steal. Is a steal. Okay.